Wow, well, um, still on cloud nine, so <laughs> if I start stumbling over my words, you'll understand why. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging um, my, my lead author on this paper, the lead author on this paper, Petra Holden, who's in the audience. Petra, I don't know where you're standing, Some, you're somewhere here. Could you stand up so everybody can see you? Um, <laughs> there she is. <laughs> um, so, I think Petra is a future prize winner. Um, she's one of the stars in our lab, and she's been fundamental to this paper, but also a lot of the other work that we do. So it wouldn't have happened without her, particularly her ability to get some of our more reluctant members to deliver on time <laughs> when we have, have deadlines. So Petra is a, a hard taskmaster for everybody. Um, so our work sits at the interface of a number of these uh, planetary boundary issues. Um, the first of them around climate change as a stressor on society, so dealing with the impacts of climate change, the emissions we can't avoid and the consequences we're already committed to. But then also other aspects of human impact on the environment. So the second area where we work is on biodiversity loss and landscape change. Um, and the third is around water stress. And in South Africa, and particularly where we live in the Southwestern Cape, all of those uh, different factors intersect with each other and interact with each other. And in, um, we are particularly interested in water security um, in the Southwestern Cape, where there have been ongoing water shortages um, and increasing demand for, for a long time. One of the suggested solutions to some of these on-the-ground impacts is something called nature-based solutions. It's probably familiar to a lot of people working in the climate change space, but the idea is restoring and enhancing the cap capacity of nature to deliver the ecosystem services that society needs, but also to increase the resilience of these local ecosystems to deliver those services. It's a very big buzzword in the climate change space now, um, but a lot of the emphasis on nature-based solutions has actually come from the north and is essentially being parachuted in to southern countries, often with a very different agenda to what's important for southern countries. So a lot of the nature-based solutions talk uh, out of the global north is around planting a billion trees to sequester carbon. The question in some semi-arid regions is, is it actually appropriate even to plant trees? Because when you plant a tree, it uses water. So you're trading off carbon for water, for instance. So understanding the interactions between these different interventions is, is really, really important. We uh, wanted to work on that um, in, well, we work on it in a number of different uh, domains, but the, the paper that we, uh, that, that we received the award for is around water stress and drought in and around Cape Town. So within uh, Cape Town and the greater area, we have what uh, people often call water towers. These are the high mountain areas, a bit like the mountains outside here, where most of the precipitation falls. We don't get as much snow as you guys do, but we get quite a lot of water. So if you compare rainfall in these mountain catchments, we're getting about three to three and a half meters of rainfall a year. If you go to Cape Town where we live, we're getting half a meter to 600 millimeters of rainfall a year. So these water towers are crucial for supplying the water that society needs, but also at risk uh, from a number of different factors. One of them in the Southwestern Cape is alien invasive species. So we have one of the most biodiverse uh, ecosystems in the world, the Cape Floristic Kingdom, the, the Feinbos that everybody knows about. If you just go into a square hundred meters, you'll find a thousand different species or something like that. It's, it's as d diverse as, as the Amazon forest. But those are very fragile ecosystems, and we've had alien woody trees, pine trees, eucalyptus, um, acacia, escaping from plantations and foresty areas and invading these catchments. And from a water perspective, this invasion then changes the water balance because these trees are essentially massive uh, evaporation pumps. 
A eucalyptus tree will use three to four times as much water a year as the natural vegetation that it has replaced. So when these catchments get invaded, a whole lot of uh, water that could have been available for the downstream ecosystems and for society just disappears back into the atmosphere through evaporation. So we worked in um, four of these mountainous catchments, but this study looked at only two of them. One of them moderately invaded, so only 9% of the catchment area uh, is actually invaded by uh, pine trees. The other one, a very difficult to access catchment where the, to actually get in to work in that catchment is, is, is really hard, is 40% invaded. Some of the other catchments are even, have even higher levels of invasion, 60 or 70%. And we were interested to try and understand how effective this catchment restoration could be in offsetting the water security issues that the, <coughs> that the region uh, suffers from. So th the question we asked in our paper was, could catchment restoration actually have offset an extreme event that was really big in the news, which was the Cape Town drought of 2015 to 2018? So we had an unprecedented three dry years. Cape Town gets its rainfall in winter. We had three dry years in succession, and that essentially led to the dams being over-abstracted each year and not refilling sufficiently. And by the end of that third year, the dams looked like this. This is a, one of the big dams supplying uh, the, the Cape Town area. So we wanted to understand whether healthy catchments could have actually offset this impact, and we actually wanted to look at two things at once. Um, we wanted to look at whether climate change had actually exacerbated the intensity of the drought, but at the same time, we wanted to look at whether uh, catchment restoration could have offset that climate change impact. So we're looking at human interventions in the planetary system from two different dimensions, and we then had to use a hydrological model to assess both the impacts of climate change on drought level river flows and different interventions in terms of catchment restoration on those water flows. So this is a bit like, um, well, we call it attribution science. Uh, it's, uh, the, the impacts attribution is quite a new area of attribution science. But essentially, we do what all of you medical scientists do as well, but in a very different way. So we have to have, uh, if, if you like, controls and intervention experiments. Um, our controls are a climate without greenhouse gases, and then our intervention is the kind of the one we're living with. Um, so you could think of that as <coughs> smoking or non-smoking with regards to heart disease or something like that. But then we also have a second intervention that we're interested in looking at, which is our ability to manage the landscapes through which these climate impacts propagate. So I th guess in a medical sense, that could be something like, um, are, you, are, are you fit or unfit? Okay, so you're looking at multiple, risk, uh, multiple factors affecting the risk or likelihood of some outcome. So unfortunately, in the real world of natural, in the natural world, we don't have hundreds of thousands of people where we can do these uh, large um, experiments, if you like. So we have to disappear into the modeling world. And we do multiple simulations of the climate with and without climate change, multiple simulations of the state of the landscape with and without interventions. And our results that we get in terms of changes in risk or risk factors are the equivalent of the differential risk between different populations in a drug experiment or something like that. So our results, um, in brief, I mean, it's really sometimes, <laughs> it's, it's a bit strange. You end up with one little graph like this that summarizes the results of five years of work, but that's, <laughs> that's where we ended up, essentially, um, with a huge amount of, of work uh, underlying it. But what we really showed was that um, anthropogenic climate change had indeed increased the risk of this mega drought that hit Cape Town. Um, somewhere around about a threefold increase in the likelihood of the, of the drought. So the risk factor was increased by 300%. If we hadn't had climate change, it would have been a one in 500 year drought. It became a one in 60 year drought or something like that. Um, we also showed that if those invaded catchments were cleared, um, it would have offset some of the impact of climate change, 
but not entirely. The climate change signal was already too strong for healthy catchments to manage all of the impacts of that drought. So it's part, so it's part of the story, but we're already uh, stressing, at least in this environment, the environment beyond which uh, managing catchments could offset that. And then we had a look at a worst case scenario, which is if um, catchment management didn't happen, and so nobody investment, invested in looking after these catchments, and, and we allowed these catchments to be fully invaded, so to go red, if you like, then you can see that the attributable influence of combined human impact on both climate and catchment state uh, reduces the drought those flows by about 40%. So it really, really would have heightened the severity of the drought and the impact of, uh, of, the, water, of, the, of the drought on water stress in Cape Town. We would never have avoided day zero if those catchments had been in a worse state than, than they are. So what does this mean for uh, planetary health and scalability? I think our study was the first, really, that's worked hard at trying to link together different uh, components of the planetary boundaries in this water stress situation. But the critical thing there was really good data. Um, we used novel remote sensing techniques to understand where the vegetation is invading, and we used high-quality um, hydrological models to model those impacts. And actually, with that, we can actually identify where in the catchment, you can get your biggest bang for buck in terms of catchment restoration. So we can actually be very targeted. So if you only have $100,000, this is where you go. If you have a million dollars, then you can do this. If you have $10 million, then we can do that. That's sort of uh, what we were able to show. Um, we also did financial modeling, uh, essentially looking at the value of water to the city of Cape Town. And we're able to show that there's actually a business case that private investors could actually believe in, in terms of investing in catchment restoration and getting a dividend in terms of the water that is produced. A 7% increase, um, a 7% return on investment over a 20 year period, uh, maybe uh, not at the moment, but that's certainly equivalent to some of the government bonds that people would be investing in over similar timescales. So there's a clear uh, route to getting the private sector involved in catchment restoration and maintenance. It's just making the case and showing that it is actually feasible. Um, I think the final message is that ecosystem-based adaptation can help to offset impacts, but it's not the silver bullet. Um, we, as we've heard, we need to be acting on multiple fronts in uh, multiple timescales to really try and get the kind of the accumulative ben benefit of, of interventions across all different domains. So in terms of um, how to use the wonderful money that's, that we've uh, been, been uh, offered. We want to expand what we're doing, because um, a lot of the work that we've been doing is testing this at a, at a, at a small scale. But if we're going to operate at scale, we really want to have this kind of framework, this data modeling framework operating um, at large scales. Um, we need to include different ecosystem services so we can start to look at trade-offs, um, because it's not always a win-win-win situation. Sometimes you do have these consequences. Um, I'm really keen that a lot of that goes into sort of, you know, you've talked a lot about open science, but I'm passionate about open data and actually making that data available. So I'm really keen to use this as an entry point to getting more investment so that African scientific data can actually be accessible to Africans. So if there's anybody with money out there who wants to talk about open data in Africa, um, please come and speak to me. Yeah. Um, we also think that it's really important to translate this evidence and knowledge that's sitting in the ivory towers into practical use. So um, being in an educational institution, we really want to leverage off that and we want to establish an ecosystem-based adaptation academy that can work um, with different actors who are involved in landscape stewardship. Um, and in particular, 
Um, we're interested in the communities that live in the landscape, a little bit like Carlos, in terms of actually finding ways through this financial modeling to give them sustainable livelihoods within the landscape that actually is their landscape, and they should be benefiting from what society requires for them in terms of landscape stewardship. So just to finish off, in addition to, uh, to Petra, um, this is... A, a, a lot, as always, this work is accumulation of many years of different little pieces that, of the jigsaw ending up in one, uh, one, one paper. And I really would like to uh, acknowledge both the other authors on the paper, but also a bigger set of collaborators who, without whom this paper wouldn't have been possible as well. So thank you very much. So I can confirm that officially this man has had the biggest smile from ear to ear on his face for this entire meeting. The okay. Frontiers Planet Prize, international champion, and it's just kept you smiling. But uh, just let me go uh, back to what you've done, because your work does fill a critical knowledge gap by quantifying whether nature-based solutions actually work. And you're going to have a kind of system of green stewards Tell me how that would work. Well, it has to happen in partnership, because one thing I know, um, unlike Carlos, <laughs> who seems to be brilliant at um, working in the community space, um, academics are not that good at working in practice. So you need implementation partners, and that's kind of what transdisciplinary research is around. It's kind of working with the right collection of individuals. So there are a whole range of organizations that are really pushing in this space in Southern Africa. One of them would be the World Wildlife Fund, um, Conservation International. And they have on the ground projects where they're trying to implement this for the benefit of communities. But what they are missing is this kind of hard evidence that can support the design and implementation of the project. So it's a real partnership between research um, society and we need government to create the enabling policy environment for, for instance, uh, the investment cases to be made. Great stuff. Thank you so much. Sure. Keep that smile.